This is the ore being shipped in from the Pinion Plain mine. This ore is some of the highest grade uranium ore that's ever come out of the United States mine. A piece of uranium, no bigger than a grape, could keep the lights on in an entire neighborhood for a year. How can something so small hold so much energy? To find the answer, we have to follow its path from the depths of remote mines to the sealed halls of high security factories, and finally, into the heart of a nuclear reactor. Along the way, we uncover a story that began over a century ago, when the strange power of uranium first revealed itself to science. A story of discovery, danger, and the quiet force that now helps power the modern world. Birth of nuclear energy and the enrichment problem. The story of enriched uranium begins not in the roar of machines, but in the stillness of a 19th century laboratory. In 1896, French physicist Henri Becquerel made an observation that would change the world. He found that uranium emitted mysterious rays on its own, without any external energy source. This invisible force, later called radioactivity, captured the imagination of Marie and Pierre Curie. Their tireless work led to the discovery of radium and polonium, proof that atoms were far from the solid, unchangeable spheres people once believed. In 1932, James Chadwick discovered the neutron, a particle without charge that could slip deep into the heart of atoms. Just six years later, German chemists Otto Hahn and Fritz Strassmann, working with insights from physicist Lisa Meitner, revealed that a uranium atom could split when struck by a neutron. This process, called fission, released an astonishing amount of energy. Suddenly, it was clear that if fission could be controlled, it could power entire cities. But there was a problem. Natural uranium is mostly uranium-238, which resists fission. Only a tiny fraction, about 0.7%, is uranium-235, the isotope that fuels the chain reaction. For nuclear power to work, the proportion of uranium-235 had to be increased. This process, known as enrichment, became one of the greatest technical challenges of the 20th century. During World War II, the Manhattan Project threw vast resources into solving it. Early methods, gaseous diffusion through porous membranes, and electromagnetic separation using magnetic fields worked, but at enormous cost. They consumed staggering amounts of energy and required vast facilities. The race was on to find a better way, one that could make enriched uranium practical, not just for weapons, but eventually for peaceful power. Centrifuge, revolution, and secrecy. The breakthrough came in the 1950s, when engineers turned to an idea that seemed almost too simple, using speed itself to separate uranium isotopes. Gas centrifuges, tall and slender cylinders, could spin uranium hexafluoride gas at incredible speeds, over 50,000 revolutions per minute. In this whirling storm, the slightly lighter uranium-235 atoms drifted inward, while the heavier uranium-238 atoms were pushed outward. By drawing off the different layers, the precious isotope could be concentrated step by step. Unlike the massive diffusion plants of the Manhattan Project, centrifuges were compact and vastly more efficient. They needed far less energy and could be linked in long cascades that worked around the clock. Each machine refined the uranium a little more until it reached the desired level of enrichment. The technology was so valuable and so dangerous in the wrong hands that it became one of the most closely guarded industrial secrets on Earth. Nations protected their designs with layers of security, aware that the same process that fuels reactors can also build weapons. Even today, centrifuge halls are hidden from public view. Their locations kept quiet. What emerged from them, however, would shape the course of nuclear energy for decades to come. Mining and extraction. Before uranium can spin in a centrifuge, 
it must be wrestled from the earth. The richest deposits lie in remote, often unforgiving landscapes. The deserts of Australia, the steppes of Kazakhstan, the rocky stretches of Canada. Together, these regions produce the majority of the world's supply. The element is locked inside minerals like uraninite or pitch blend, usually in low concentrations of just 0.1 to 2%. Extracting it demands scale and precision. In open pit mines, enormous excavators peel back layers of soil and rock to expose the ore. Underground mines follow a different path, tunneling deep beneath the surface through narrow shafts. In some locations, a method called in-situ leaching avoids removing rock at all. Instead, chemical solutions, often sulfuric acid or carbonates, are injected into the deposit through wells, dissolving the uranium underground. The solution is then pumped to the surface, where the uranium can be separated. Every method carries challenges, from environmental impacts to worker safety. The ore, whether lifted by truck or pumped as liquid, is only the beginning. It leaves the mine dull and unremarkable. But within its grains lies the potential for extraordinary power. That potential will only be revealed through the next steps in its long transformation. Processing into yellow cake and conversion to UF6. Once mined, the uranium ore is taken to processing plants, where it begins its transformation. First, the rock is crushed into particles as coarse as sand, making it easier to separate uranium from other minerals like quartz or iron. The crushed ore is then mixed with acidic or alkaline solutions in large steel tanks. Through careful chemical reactions, the uranium dissolves, leaving behind unwanted materials. What emerges from this process is a bright yellow powder known as yellow cake, uranium oxide, about 80% pure. Its faint metallic smell and low radioactivity belie the energy it holds. One ton can match the output of several million tons of coal. Even so, workers handle it with protective suits and masks, avoiding the inhalation of fine particles. From here, the yellow cake travels to conversion plants. There, it is purified once more and reacted with hydrofluoric acid inside sealed corrosion-resistant vessels. The result is uranium hexafluoride, or UF6, a compound that becomes a gas at just 56 degrees. This makes it perfect for enrichment. In its cooled form, UF6 forms pale green crystals, nicknamed nuclear snow by technicians. But its beauty is deceptive. It is reactive and dangerous, stored only in thick steel cylinders until it's ready for the next critical stage. Enrichment in practice. Inside enrichment facilities, uranium hexafluoride gas begins its most delicate transformation. It is fed into gas centrifuges, tall, slender machines made from ultra-strong steel or carbon composites. Spinning at more than 50,000 revolutions per minute inside vacuum chambers, they create a force thousands of times stronger than gravity. This force pushes the heavier uranium-238 toward the outer wall, while the lighter, more fissile uranium-235 concentrates closer to the center. Each centrifuge produces only a small increase in enrichment, so hundreds or even thousands are linked together in what's known as a cascade. The gas flows from one to the next, gradually increasing its uranium-235 content to the target level, around 5% for most commercial reactors. Sensors constantly monitor temperature, speed, and vibration. Even a tiny imbalance can damage the rotor. Automated systems make minute adjustments to keep the process stable. The output is divided into two streams, enriched uranium, destined for fuel fabrication, and depleted uranium, which has uses in shielding and industrial applications. When the gas has reached the desired purity, it is withdrawn and prepared for the next step, its return to a solid form. From here, 
Uranium's transformation into a fuel capable of powering entire cities is almost complete. Fuel pellet and assembly production. Once enriched, uranium hexafluoride gas is converted back into uranium oxide powder. This fine dark material is pressed into small cylindrical pellets, each about the size of a fingertip, but holding the energy of a ton of coal. The pellets are baked at around 1400 degrees, becoming dense and durable enough to endure years inside a reactor. Every pellet is checked with x-rays, laser measurements, and chemical tests to ensure perfect dimensions and purity. They are then stacked into zirconium alloy tubes, chosen for their strength and transparency to neutrons. Robots perform the stacking in sealed, dust-free chambers before laser welding the rods shut. These fuel rods are grouped into assemblies, each containing dozens of rods arranged in precise grids. Weighing hundreds of kilograms, a single assembly can power hundreds of homes for a year, ready to begin the controlled release of the energy locked deep within uranium's core. Inside the reactor and spent fuel management. In the reactor core, fuel assemblies packed with uranium pellets begin their work. Neutrons strike uranium-235 atoms, splitting them and releasing heat along with more neutrons to sustain the chain reaction. Control rods made of boron or cadmium slide between the assemblies, absorbing excess neutrons to keep the process stable. Thick concrete walls surround the core, shielding workers and the outside world. The heat turns water into high-pressure steam, driving turbines that generate electricity for entire cities. After about a year, the fuel is spent, though still dangerously hot and radioactive. Using remote systems, operators move the rods into deep cooling pools where clear water acts as both coolant and radiation shield. Beneath the surface, a faint blue glow, Cherenkov radiation, marks the last traces of energy. Even here, long after its peak, uranium's power lingers, waiting for safe storage or the next stage in its long journey. Uranium is a paradox, an element that can level cities or light them for generations. In its enriched form, it is both feared and relied upon, a reminder of how closely danger and progress can coexist. From the stillness of ancient rock to the hum of centrifuges and the steady thrum of turbines, its journey is one of transformation and control. For all the caution it demands, it offers something rare, constant, carbon-free power in a world searching for cleaner energy. In the glow of a reactor's core, we see both the risks we guard against and the future we dare to build.